welcome back to Tuesday Dobbses. Can I just apologize from the start? It's really warm today. I think it's about 25 degrees outside and this room has very, very little ventilation. So if my appearance starts to get more and more ridiculous looking as this episode goes on, please just, just ignore me or you can turn your head and just listen to the podcast episode. So my apologies in advance. I've had more more messages this week about things in the news than I often do. So I'm going to make this slightly more news focused this episode. But before I do, thank you everyone. I'll just get to this before I forget. Thank you all for sending in and sharing your thoughts and opinions in the comments section below. It's hugely valuable for me to carry on with all of these episodes, being able to read your thoughts and feelings. So carry on with that, please. And send an email over to hi at Tuesday at Dobbs.com if you've got a longer story, maybe with some pictures as well. And then you can follow Instagram because I often share some of those pictures. Tuesday underscore at underscore Dobbs. Let's begin. The news. Triumph. Two new 400cc bikes. One's a Scrambler and one's a Speed 400. In essence... These two bikes are going to sit below the Triumph Speed Twin 900 and the Scrambler 900. And they will go up regardless of what Triumph said. I'm sure I spoke to Triumph and they said they're not in competition with Royal Enfield, but of of course they are. Direct competition. These will go up against, in my eyes, the classic 350. Although actually, spec-wise, at least horsepower-wise, they're closer to the Interceptor because these bikes will be 40 horsepower with prices to be confirmed and they are available January 2024. So if the Interceptor is £6,500, the Speed Twin 900 is about £8,300. The Classic 350 is all the way down here at about £4,300. If these Triumphs can fit right here between five to six thousand pounds, and if I would try to put my finger on it, I think Triumph will put them at about five thousand six hundred pounds. If they come in around about there, I would say they could well be onto a winner. Indian made, they look like lovely quality, they look good in general. The only slight thing for me is. Royal Enfield have perfected the art of making the small displacement engine desirable to everyone regardless of age and experience. A 50-year-old would go out and buy a classic 350, downgrading his 1,000cc superbike, and I know of plenty of people who have done it, because the classic 350 isn't a smaller version of another bike. It's just a cool bike in its own right regardless of how big the engine is. People don't care. It's just a cool, proper-sized bike. But the Speed 400 and the 400X, they very much feel like a stepping stone to the next bike. So they look incredibly good. I don't need to try one to know they're going to handle sublimely well, but they're definitely aimed more at the beginner level rider and probably in my eyes not quite as appealing for people who simply want to downsize to a smaller bike. For that, you would probably go for the likes of a Royal Enfield. But I think it's a, sec- it's a sector of the market that Triumph need to get into, and I think they've done a really good job. I think they look good. I move on. Let's get to electrification now. This is relevant for both cars and bikes, of course. And there's been some big stuff in the news. So let me just skim through a few of the key bits. VW, I begin here. VW to cut electric vehicle production. This is massive. And this is from This Is Money, funnily enough. This is huge news. I'm quoting. In what's been dubbed an unprecedented move, the German car giant is set to scale back EV outputs at one of its biggest production facilities in Emden, northwest Germany, due to strong customer reluctance to buy battery powered models. Company execs said demand for its all electric models is down 30% on forecasts. I'm, I'm in general pro anything that will save the environment. I'm not anti electric at all. 
But I know that electric is still a very, very, very long way off from being proper mainstream where your, your average man or woman can go out and buy it simply because they just don't make sense at the moment as it is. It's improving all the time, but the fact is for cars, they still don't really make sense for the majority of people. And for bikes, we're a colossal way off. We're even further off bikes than we are for cars. I mean, bikes, I don't really think the bike industry are wanting to invest too much money in it at the moment because what is the point in making a bike with a hundred mile range? There is no point. It can only be a commuter bike. So if you're only going to have a commuter bike that will get you 10 miles down the road and then back again, then there's no point worrying about any level of performance or any touring capability. And if you are in the city and you have an electric bike, the only thing that works is a removable battery because most people in the city, the nature of living in a city, you're going to live in an apartment. And the last thing you want to do, going to do is try and navigate around lots of different charging centers and try and find one that works. You need to charge at home every night for it to make sense, for it to be seamless. So it must have a removable battery. But a lot of the time for bigger bikes, removable batteries would just be too heavy. And there's the problem. We're stuck at this point. Ranges aren't getting any bigger. And that's the end of it until technology improves. Here's one other issue as well. The price of a normal VW Golf is £26,500. The price of the all-electric ID3 is £36,300 and it's got a range real world of 200 miles. So now with everything going on in the world, with rates going up, with expenses going up, with uncertainty through the roof, in every element of life, who can possibly justify spending £10,000 extra on a vehicle? It's not going to happen. It's going to be a, a real shock for the electric industry because it's way too big a risk for too many people to spend that kind of money on a vehicle. I move on. Advertising watchdog bans Hyundai and Toyota electric car adverts. This is from The Guardian. The UK advertising watchdog has banned campaigns by Toyota and Hyundai for exaggerating the speed at which electric cars can be charged and misleading customers about the availability of rapid charging points across the UK and Ireland. Hyundai ran a similar campaign using its own website. And that. That is the 125cc bike that always rips around outside. I've had so many people messaging saying, any vehicle, even if it's a 125cc bike, can be just as loud as a loud Harley. And there, that's the proof. That's the 15th time he's done that today. Main travel points on motorways. Okay, so Hyundai had a similar campaign with a big billboard in London's Piccadilly Square and a YouTube film featuring footballers from Premier League club Chelsea with South Korean car manufacturer sponsors promoting the Ionic 5 model electric car. In the campaign, it claimed that the vehicle could be charged from 10 to 80% in 18 minutes, but the Advertising Standards Authority received complaints challenging whether the charging times, which both companies admitted, were achieved in perfect factory conditions were achievable in the real world. You know, JB, JB, sorry, I, I've, I've lost where I saved your message, but JB messaged me and he asked if I were given the option of doing, or if electric motorbikes were an option for doing the Highland Scramble that I've just done, would it be as enjoyable and would it even be possible? And there's no question about that, JB. At the current state it's in, it would be a complete impossibility to even contemplate using electric motorbikes for doing the Highland Scramble. I really believe we're, I think we're 20 years away, we're 10 at most, uh, sorry, 10 at least, 10 years away at least to get the technology up there where it needs to be and to get the infrastructure. 10 to 20 years, I really believe it, JB. But I will share one bit of good news in the interest of fairness and, and being balanced. This is exciting. This is probably one of the first things I've ever heard where I thought, oh, now this is game changing. 
This is a really game-changing article. Toyota claims, and this is from Motor1.com, Toyota claims it's made a technological breakthrough that will eventually lead to a solid-state battery capable of delivering up to 745 miles of range, all while completely recharging in 10 minutes, according to The Guardian. Quoting Keji Keita, president of the company's research and development center for carbon neutrality. The Japanese car manufacturer said yesterday it had simplified production of materials used to make both solid state and liquid based batteries, which will allow it to halve the weight, halve the size and also greatly reduce the cost of packs that end up in vehicles. Well, when that happens, I think I'll be ready to go electric because that's a colossal, colossal game changer. That will change everything if that happens. Let's get to some of your interesting feedback now. From Mark. Good morning. You got me thinking. Oh, I like this, Mark. So Mark messaged in, I think it was a few weeks ago, and this got lost on my desktop. This is, this is a nice story about reusing, making the most of your vehicle. Do you always need to change and upgrade your vehicle? Can you just adapt it to different scenarios, to different tastes as you grow up? Or as you grow up or as you get older, your tastes mature? Good morning. You got me thinking when on the cost of bikes. My BMW 1200 GS cost me 10,000 pounds when new in 2015. I tell you what I'll do. In fact, I'll get to that in a second. I'll put pictures up at the same time I chat about them. That's, that price, £10,000, is with all of the extras, ABS, luggage, etc. But 18 years on, okay, let's start the pictures. We've got a lot of them. Let's begin. 18 years on and 55,000 miles in, I still have it. This now must work out as the cheapest bike I've ever owned. It's been modified for long distances and for long distance travel, sorry, by me over the years with a bigger fuel tank and charging ports, etc. I've got several other bikes, but I think the GS will be forever in my garage. She's gone through some color changes and I'll send you pics of the old girl. Scotland, 2005 when I bought her, that's it, in silver. Then the other one was taken in the desert in Morocco in 2008, where I fitted it with spoked wheels and painted it yellow. Again, another pick is from, is fully loaded, heading over to Germany for the BMW GS meeting. And then another is how it's been for the past four years. Now modified with a 30 liter fuel tank painted in Ford Performance Blue. And the top box has power for charging inside. It also has Corbin heated seats, pivot pegs, and many more mods over 18 years. This was taken, this pic here, finally to wrap it up. This was taken today at work. I love it so much that I park it so I can see it from where I'm working. It's a great story, Mark. To have had it for so long, 18 years, it owes you nothing at all. And in its current guise, let me just open this up again, of how you've got it now, They've aged so well, these GSs. Really so well. It still looks current, up to date, and it's got all of that character from all of those stories that you have to tell. Brilliant. Mark, thank you. I move on. It's unusual for me, actually, and I do like BMWs, but I don't often talk about them enough. This carries on with BMW. This is someone talking response and replying in response to my awful issues I've had with Triumph's aftermarket parts and my bike is still awaiting parts. I won't go into it too much because I'll bore you, but it's still awaiting parts. Nigel replied to my issues. Maybe buy an old BMW. They still, listen to this, they still make spares for every BMW bike they've ever made. And there are the likes of Motorworks and Motor Bins who supply genuine and pattern parts at very reasonable prices. There were so many people who got in touch to say exactly the same as Nigel, to say that there is almost every single part for every BMW 
ever made, readily available, usually they can be at your door within 24 to 48 hours after purchasing. And I had so many people echoing this that BMW's aftermarket, and aftermarket, sorry, used, let me get my words out right, BMW's spare parts catalog is, is completely comprehensive. People just having no issue with any BMW parts. So I had a look at this, Nigel. Let me see if I can find the page. And I thought I'd have a look at one of the companies you recommended. Let me put this up here, motorbins.co.uk. And I typed in a random model. BMW R45, 1981 to 1984. So we're looking at a 40 year old bike. And you can see they've got everything. You click on the section you want, brakes, cables, clutch, camshaft, etc., etc. I decided to click on engine parts and just have a look at this. They've got everything. They tell you if it's in stock and the list is endless from engine oil drain washer to engine oil drain plugs, connecting rod bolts, rocker axles. I could go on and on and on. And I would say probably 95, I'm scrolling through to the end, I've seen four bits out of stock, five, probably 95% of bits are all in stock. And this is just one of the companies that supplies BMW parts, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parts. And I've only found five little bits out of stock at the moment. Yeah, I, I didn't realize BMW was, was so well catered for, 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 used, for used bikes and the parts that they need. Fascinating. Thank you for sending that, Nigel. Moving on to Kev. Freddie, on the subject of noise and imminent UK noise cameras, I own what is termed a classic bike or classic bikes in the way of Ducatis, Goodsees, uh, though for me they are just ordinary bikes that I've not replaced. These bikes were not designed or ever intended uh, to ever meet the modern noise regulations. Are we not enforcing contemporary standards to previous times? Does this not effectively mean a ban for old bikes? Regards, Kev. This is with regards to a discussion about potential, not speed cameras, but noise cameras coming to stop these insanely loud bikes that non-bikers get annoyed about. And Kev, my, I, I truly think, let's say if I were in a local council or if I were in government, I would be very, very strong on this. And I would say you cannot retrospectively change things. You can't go back and say, OK, now we've decided that this vehicle can't be used in this situation and that this loud, old, classic Ducati now has to conform to modern regulations. I really hate retrospective laws kind of being put into place. I think it cannot happen at all. And I think that goes with everything, personally. I think if a vehicle is allowed to be used somewhere, then it should always be allowed to be used somewhere. And I know it's a tricky one. It's really hard, especially in cities, but I think fine for new vehicles to make them all economical and environmentally friendly, and that's brilliant. I'm 100% up for that. But when the government start changing the parameters for people who've already bought vehicles and making it less and less pleasant for those people who've spent all their money and bought vehicles, a lot of the time the vehicles the government has said they should have bought, for example, diesel cars, then when the government start changing that for vehicles you've already bought, retrospectively changing that, I, I really don't like that at all. So Kev, I think if it were up to me, you would be allowed to ride your Ducati, your Goodsees freely without any issue at all, because that's the way they were made and they passed all the requirements back then. So why on earth should they not still be allowed? That would be my strong thought on that, Kev. Lovely garage, sounds like you've got. Move on. Mark in Watford. Freddie, I used to own a Suzuki 750 when in Australia 30 odd years ago. 
Never had a license for it, I'm sorry to say, but I taught myself to ride going around Australia, albeit probably badly. I, I'm using, I'm, I love that, teaching yourself to ride a 750 in Australia. 30 years ago, I'm riding a YBI Yamaha 125, but planning a four to five week tour around Spain where I'll get my license realistically next year. I'll be looking at a secondhand V-Strom, unsure if 850 or 1050 cc. Any advice would be greatly appreciated, Freddie. Or am I looking at too big a bike? I'm 60 next year, so it would be a bike to keep. I want the comfort and a stress-free ride. Or would it be better, or would I be better off going for second-hand BMW F850 GS? Okay, Mark, I've just been spending the past 20 minutes before having a look at these. These from 800, too new to get a second-hand one. These are 776 cc, 64 mpg, 10 and a half thousand pounds. Now this comes in just about, just about at the very top end of your budget. So the positive about this one, Mark, you can go out and buy a brand new bike with three years warranty. It's got 83 horsepower. It will be more than enough for you. And these V-Stroms, the new ones, they've got a, a definite, simple, almost 1980s style utilitarian charm. I quite like the look of them actually. And you will have three years stress-free riding and it's Japanese, so you'll probably have a lot longer than that. Then you get up to the V-Strom 1050. Now this is a three, thousand pound premium so well over your budget if you want it new but you can get a second hand v-strom now now this is interesting bear in mind the new v-strom is thirteen thousand seven hundred pounds second hand you can get them for seven and a half let me put this example up seven and a half thousand pounds now that's three years old it's 106 horsepower and it's 236 kilos so you get way more performance for, especially if you get second hand, for around about 3,000 cheaper than the 800 brand new model. So if I'm looking at that now, and if it were me doing it, I still like the look of that three-year-old one. I still think it looks good. I may be quite tempted, Mark, to go with a second hand 1050 for seven and a half thousand pounds especially if you want to do some Euro touring, that would just be all day, all day comfort. And with regards to, are you looking at too big a bike? No, honestly, you're not. You'll be totally fine with that. You're, you're a mature gentleman. You're not a 17 year old who's going to be wheeling. It won't be too big for you. You'll be absolutely fine with that kind of a bike. Even though the 800 can do it, that's such a good deal to get a 1050 for seven and a half. I'd be tempted by that. But there's one that trumps it all, Mark. And I didn't expect to say this, but I've just been researching this bike. And I'm going to put this as my bike for the week. So thank you for bringing this to my attention. The BMW F850GS. This would be my pick out of all of them, Mark. It's 94 horsepower. It's 225 kilos and it costs 10,750 pounds new. You know, which is, which I found fascinating. It's in essence, as near as makes no difference, the same price brand new for that BMW as the V-Strom. And while I like the V-Strom, that BMW is a very handsome looking bike. And you can get a second hand one for six thousand pounds. Let me see if I can get one up here. I mean, you're so at the bottom end of budget here if you chose second hand. Five thousand nine hundred and ninety nine pounds for 2018 BMW F850 GS. And it looks brilliant. This would be my pick. I think that's a great looking adventure bike. MCN rated highly. Owner's reliability rating 4.6 out of 5. Owner's overall rating 4.4 out of 5. And MCN's rating 5 out of 5. It's, this is a really good looking bike. Let me read just the first two lines here from MCN. 
Who needs big capacity adventure bikes when the new F850 GS is around? Its characterful engine manages to both purr and roar at the same time. Handling's faultless, comfortable, practical, and a piece of cake to live with. Standard spec is impressive, optional and extras so uh, more so, and it's less of a handful off-road than its 1200cc brother. The baby GS has finally come of age. If it were my man, money, Mark, that would be the one for me, without question. I move on. I want to share a Dutch gentleman's impressions and thoughts on a few different topics. Have a listen to this. Four points. Number one. Freddie, it seems like a good time to finally get another bike. Or as you said, just get that custom gasket. Second point. Well, I, you're right there. You're right, Nick. Second point. I have an Apple AirTag on my bike. Unfortunately, AirTags have this anti-stalking feature, so it only works against theft if the thief or the thieves ignore the stalking message. Also, it can reduce insurance costs in the L. In the L. Not sure what that means. But I've heard a few people saying this. AirTags actually don't work well for motorcycle trackers because they do have this anti-stalking feature. And the theory behind it is, let's say I am some kind of pervert or something and I've got an Apple AirTag. I could put it in someone's pocket and follow them home. So the person who is near that air tag, Apple has to warn them and say, look, someone has an air tag, something like this, going off around you. Do you want to stop it? And then they can just press stop. I think that's a simplified version of how it works. So I do get it from that point of view. You have to protect people's privacy. And that, that alone means that an air tag is compromised with regards to uh, a real genuine useful tracker. Final two points from Nick. Yes, a Norton may be made in England, but many parts probably are still produced elsewhere. The dash, probably China. Suspension by Olins, brakes by Brembo. Exhaust may have been done by another party. ABS may be done by Bosch. Fuel injection system also done by Bosch. They are owned by TVS from India which is responsible for the BMW G310R. And surprise, TVS also sells a 310cc. And finally, point number four. Furthermore, as a Dutchman, I couldn't care less if a motorcycle is made in, <laughs> in the UK. Truth be told, I don't feel the UK or France, thank you for dragging France down with us, or France are countries that make lasting products. We're probably not, it's a fair point, we're probably not world renowned for absolute quality products anymore in the UK. I mean, I say anymore, it's not like we were famous for making good quality cars and bikes in the, well, certainly 70s and 80s. I think it was a complete joke. So yeah, that's a very fair point to make. And I'll wrap it up there with some great insight from a Dutch gentleman. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. Have a brilliant week. I'll speak to you in the next one.